You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. It is time once again for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, the program where we break it all down. What's lighting it up over there at CME Group this week? Is it going to be the rates? Is it going to be the ags? Is it going to be the metals, the energy, crypto? Who knows? Let's dive in and crunch the numbers. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting network upon which so many of you have been binging of late. I'm reminding you out there, if you like what you hear, keep those reviews, keep those comments coming on your platform. A choice really does help new folks continue to discover our content here in the madness that is 2021. We want to keep that flow going. So if you like what you hear, keep those reviews, those ratings coming. It does Help at the end of the day. Of course, keep those questions coming, too. We do love to hear from you guys out there. Let's see who we're hearing from today. First, I am pleased to say we're going back out there to the newly minted FTSE Russell Studios, where we are joined once again by Mr. Sean Smith, the Managing Director of Derivatives Licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Mr. Dan, or just Mr. Dan, that's next. Mr. Smith, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. Mark, great to be back. It's going to be a great show today. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I'm really looking forward to today's show because we've got, uh, as you just mentioned, you're going to announce Dan the Man joining us. I'm really excited to have him on the show with us again. There we go. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, sir. We can also hear our other cohort holding down the CME Group hot seat this week, Mr. Dan Gramza, the president over there at Gramza Capital Management. Dan, welcome back to TWIFO. For the first time in 2021, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's great to be with you both, and Happy New Year, since we haven't had a chance to talk. 
I really am looking forward to 2021. And we're going to have a lot of interesting markets developing, as we do right now. So I'm looking forward to it, exploring these with you both. All right, then. Let's get to it. Let's kick it off, as we always do, with our Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers report. All right, let's do it. This is the portion of the show where I turn it over to one of you folks. We'll go out to Dan and our, our guest this week and let you choose where we should begin our journey, gentlemen. Should we go to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, or to the dark side? Dan, where should we begin our journey this week, sir? I think we should start on the dark side. I like it. I knew I liked the cut of your jib there, Mr. Gramza. All right, dark side it is. Don't tell Sean. We start in dark side. We may, we may scare him. Early in the show, these are, of course, the the five biggest decliners over there at CME Land. By the way, you guys can run our TWIFO reports for yourselves, completely free of charge, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO or slash TWIO, T-W-I-O, both places for you to go to get that great free content. It's literally unlike anything else you're going to find. It's completely free, so get on over there. If you want to upgrade, there are upgrades you can do to get some more premium versions, but the base report is available for you folks Completely for free. All right, number five to the dark side this week. Soybeans, off and even 4%. Looks like a rough week for some of the ags here. Number four, soybean meal, off 4.47%. Number three, nat gas. If it is a week, nat gas is going to be in the upside or downside. It just it moves that much, listeners. It's also a pretty cheap contract. It's off 6.6%. Good for number three to the dark side this week. Numero dos here. Lumber, another one that moves quite a bit off. Nearly 17%. 16.96%. That's number one to our dark side last week as well. It was off almost 9% last week. And so if you're saying we should break that down, I wish we could. It only did 93 contracts from an options perspective. Not a lot to parse there from a skew or anything else really perspective out there. But it is an active contract. I'm waiting for the day when lumber really starts lighting it up so we could dive into it because I feel bad. It moves so much, yet we can't really analyze it too much. And you might say, well, 16, almost 17%. That's not number one. What the heck is number one to the dark side? You can probably guess. It's Bitcoin, 19.56%. In the red this week, rough week. Coming at showtime, it was about 31,000. It's like it's ticked up a little bit now, 32,000, but a far cry, about 10,000 points off of its high recently out there, off about 2,500 points today. So a rough day, rough week for Bitcoin out there. Interesting stuff. Let's move up to the light side now. Sean's favorite area of the tape. Number five, feeder cattle. So some of the livestock fighting through there, up two. 0.02%. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, not a huge option story there as well. About 5,000. So it does some. does more than lumber. <laughs> it does a lot more than lumber. So from that perspective, it's active. But not a ton of uh, paper on the tape. A rough rice, number four to the upside, up 2.5%. It was number five in the same direction last week. Uh, pretty much uh, up about 4% last week. So a good couple of weeks for rough rice. Before you get excited, 374 options contracts on the tape this week, listeners. Number three, the E-mini NASDAQ, up about 3.6%. Numero dos, also back out to the livestock. Our old friend Lean Hogs, up 4.03%. They do some numbers, 28,000 contracts on the tape out there in Lean Hogs. We may have, to, may have to pay a visit out there this week. We'll see. A little hog love on the tape. Number one, with a bullet to the upside this week, Euro dollar. It's been moving a bit of late, up 9.2%. It was number two in the other direction last week, off 7.5%. For such a deep, liquid contract, this thing has some movement of late and has some vol as well. Speaking of vol, we've added a new wrinkle to our Movers and Shakers reports, listeners. We, we try to break down some of the advancing and declining volatility for you over the past week as well. If you guys have the premium versions of the Twifle report, you guys can get this for yourselves as well declining you might want to guess you probably can guess even though it is moving quite a bit it still is hard to merit the astronomical levels of volatility that it has right now is north of 150 i believe not too long ago so it's bitcoin and again these look at 
various durations within the same product as well. So you're going to have the same product popping up a bunch of times like we do in the case for Bitcoin. The number one declining volatility this week is the Bitcoin 30-day contract. It's down about 35%. <laughs> I mean, percent of percent. I get it. It drives people crazy in the vol space, but that's kind of how we have to do it here. Number two is the Bitcoin 60-day contract. That's off about 25%. And number three in the declining vol space for this week is the Bitcoin 90-day contract, off about 22%. Uh, in the upside, in the other direction, we have Class 3 milk, 30-day Class 3 milk contract, up about 8%. So a little bit of vol in milk land. A uh, euro dollar up about 3%. And if you go down all the way to number five, you get the class three milk, 60 day up about 2%. So a lot of stuff to parse here. You know, we may have to start, Dan, usually I would ask you where we'll start. But I think we may have to start in our old friend uh, crypto, just because we didn't have a chance to do a crypto rundown on Monday. We were off for the Martin Luther King holiday. It doesn't do a lot of paper, so it's kind of hard, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. It's, it's, tom- it's dominating just about every other metric we have. It's dominating our movers and shakers, just both from an underlying perspective, from a vol perspective. Let's see if we can crunch some numbers. Let's see if they had some numbers out there in Bitcoin. If you want to play for yourselves, listeners, go to the drop down, go to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, and you'll see where we are right now coming into, this was marking the Bitcoin reference rate. That CME obviously trades their contracts off of at about a 35,000 earlier in the session. So this obviously has come off a little bit since these levels here on the report. And let's see, Vol out there in that front contract, which has come in quite a bit, still at about a 145. <laughs> it's got about, oh, 13, almost 14 days to go. So right at that cutoff for us out there. Still not the most active of contracts. Only 829 contracts on the tape this week. So kind of hard to parse a skew uh, perspective out here, but still, that's a 5x contract, so you're talking a little more, about 4,000. It's a little more respectable when you think of it in terms of actual uh, actual coins changing hands out there. The most active contract was the 35,000 contract with a whopping 361 going up out here. I'll give you some skew numbers, but bear in mind, these are some wide markets out here, so bear that in mind. We're talking about it here. The skew, let's see, about 72% of the paper this week went up in that Jan contract. So let's go over there. And the skew out there, the puts were 2.9% cheap last week. This week, 8.1% cheap. So puts getting cheaper. And the calls, 23.6% rich. This week, 12.9% rich. So calls coming in quite a bit. Puts getting cheaper. Interesting stuff afoot out here. Uh, Dan, have you been paying attention, I'm sure, over there at your website? You know, Dan Grams, I know you break down, I think the total is approximately 700 contracts a day or something like that over there. But has crypto getting a lot of action and a lot of requests from the users and listeners over there, Dan? Well, it is. It it is. And what's interesting about Bitcoin is, first, what is it? You know, one of the questions I get asked a lot, is it a currency? Is it a commodity? What is this thing? And I don't know the answer, by the way, but it is something that leans towards a currency because you can take something and buy something with it. So the idea is that there's a perception of value, and you can take this perception of value and buy something with it. So it probably leans more towards that direction. The other aspect of it, and I think that's the challenges that we're seeing with it now, what underlies this this uh, market. What is the foundation behind it? In Japanese yen, you got Japanese yen. In live cattle, you have live cattle. Or corn, you have corn. In Bitcoin, you have intention. It is what I call an excuse market. Gold and silver are kind of like that in a way. They're an excuse market. So let's go back to Bitcoin. Uh, Now we get up to the magic 40,000. And we did that a a few days ago, and we've seen sellers at that level. So the question is, who has been selling this market? Is it buyers selling to take profits? Well, we've seen this and made another attempt just about four or five days ago back towards that 40,000. And again, it backed off, and it's trading a little over 32,000 right now. It's a market that can be dominated by a few players. And I think that's one of the scary things about Bitcoin. And they're referred to as whales. So is that what we're seeing? Are we seeing whales coming into this market, dominating it, and having this influence, selling it off? So they buy it cheaper. 
Is that what we're seeing here? What is the fundamental drivers behind this? A lot of people say Bitcoin takes order flow away from gold. But if you and I look at correlations, if we look at the relationship of Bitcoin to other markets, other currency markets, and gold or silver, for example, that correlation between these markets is not consistent. So the challenge for Bitcoin, what are the drivers? It's not consistent in that regard. Does interest rate, for example, have a big play here? It doesn't seem so. And not only that, then what are the not only fundamental drivers, but that relationship? Can we look at this in regard to other markets? Can other markets provide us a clue about what's happening in Bitcoin? And again, from my point of view, I don't think there's been anything consistent to show us that. So I'm skeptical of those kind of relationships. And so right now, it's kind of drifting out there. I'm really looking for a sideways move between 30000 and 40000 possibly for the next couple of weeks. And if we get back towards 40000 here's the thing. If, it's good, if buyers are here, when we get to that level, we need to close, not trade above, but close above that 40000 ideally around 41000 That would be a sign that buyers may be coming back into this market. So with the volatility we've seen, uh, I find the numbers that you've just given us not too surprising, except one thing. And, you know, and that's what's so interesting, Mark, about what you do. When you talked about those calls, you know, why are calls being bid up? Uh, they're being bid up because it goes back to perception. One of the characteristics of Bitcoin, especially when we got near 40,000, it's what I call an anxiety trade. It's where people say, oh, my gosh, the train's left the station. I'm not on it. So you'll have people now start participating in this market only because they feel it could go higher and they maybe have missed the big move. So you have that anxiety built in there. And I think that's what's reflected in those calls. It's an anxiety move more than it is a fundamental driver that would put people into buying calls. Interesting. It's kind of hard to use the word fundamentals and Bitcoin sometimes in the same sentence there, Dan, because they are, they are such sometimes contrasting things. All right, we had to do a quick segue into Bitcoin, just to touch on. We didn't get a chance to do crypto rundown this week, so it's not the biggest options product. Now let's move on to some ones that are big options product. Dan, you're our guest. I'll let you choose where we hang our hats next. Which product, which complex is drawing your eye this week, sir? Well, I think one that's interesting, I mean, we have the indexes. Those are interesting. Crude oil is also interesting. Uh, if you look at some of the behavior we've seen there and some of the longer-term outlook, I think, for that market, shall we take a look at uh, crude oil? Crude oil. Okay, sir, we can do that. Ask and you shall receive. Listeners, if you want to find that for yourselves, you know where to go. Go into that drop-down on the TWIFO report. Go into Energy. And then crude oil, click on that WTI tab, and you'll be off to the races. Remember now, I like to hit select all. It's up to you whether you need that much data, <laughs> a mountain of data in your lives out there listening. But for me, I kind of like it. All right, moving on here. Bitcoin, Bitcoin. That's where we just were. Easy for me to say. WTI is still looking firm, still looking north of that magical, mythical 50 handle out there. Not a huge week in terms of a movement perspective out here in WTI. Almost 52.5 coming into showtime, up slightly, about a third of a percent net on the week. But not a huge mover and shaker week here from an underlying perspective for all things WTI. In terms of where the action is, 43, almost 44% of the paper this week. By the way, if you're wondering, 332,000 contracts on the tape. So a decent week out here for WTI. Puts up some numbers. 43, almost 44% of that coming in the March contracts. That's where we'll hang our hat out here this week. The vol, by the way, in the March contract, 33 and a half. Up about 1.2 points. So that's, that's a decent amount of vol for 
all things WTI. If you've been paying attention, you know it can get higher, certainly, and it can certainly trend a lot lower. So we're kind of hovering in the elevated but not blowing the doors off kind of range out there right now. Skew-wise, let's see. The puts were leading the dance last week. They were pretty big, 16.1% rich to the at the moment. That means a 16.1% premium, listeners, to that already lofty 33.5 level is what you had to pay if you wanted to buy some. 25 Delta puts out there. The puts this week, 13.5% rich. So coming in a little bit, but still pretty juicy. Calls, 10.6% cheap last week. This week, 7.9%. So calls getting a little bit bid. Puts coming a little bit in. Kind of a little bit of a move skew-wise out here in all things WT. Let's see what the most active contract was out here. And given the fact that we're hovering right around a little bit north of that 50 strike, not surprising that's the 50 puts that seem to be dominating everyone's attention out here, doing 14,300 contracts for our number one most active WTI contract out here. The most active day was Wednesday with 8,000. Uh, the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Looks like mostly opening, pretty much all opening throughout the entire week here. So a lot of opening put paper in March here on the 50 strike, which again, we've talked for a while, is there... A lot of interest, a lot of support for WTI north of the 50 handle. We've seen OPEC make some moves to try to try to drum up these levels a little bit, give some support for them. But is there demand also at these prices? A lot of things become viable, shale, everything else. They can they could turn those spigots back on and do it for gusto. So it's it's an interesting open question right now whether we can maintain these 50 levels. Demand, of course, is the other side of that. What's going on? Global demand. Is that going to tick back up again? People are going to be flying and driving and doing other things that consume oil. Again, right now, it seems like 50 puts out here opening for much of the week, perhaps maybe indicating that that's not the case. Mr. Dan, I know you probably pay a lot of attention to crude over there. What's been lighting up your tape this week, sir? Well, I think you did a very good summary Mark, of the things that are really... The I try, Dan. Marks. I try hard uh, when you're on. I bring my A-game. <laughs> <laughs> you do. It, it's a very good summary of where we are and why are we here also. And do we have that supply-demand balance that can really cause this thing uh, You know, when it comes to having some kind of movement directionally? And here's, I guess, what I find interesting. I'm surprised that we're going to see any kind of strong movement here. I'm looking for 50 to $55, possibly for the rest of the year. And it goes back to the points that you raised. You know, if you look at that demand, we don't have the transportation systems in place. We don't have all the airlines flying all their planes. So what we see there is that decrease in that global demand, not just here in the United States. Where we are seeing some demand picking up, though, is in China. And China is buying some U.S. crude. And we're at we are levels. Once we got above 50, our shale producers in the United States can be profitable. So for that segment of the oil producing industry, it's a positive thing. It's an area that gives people some comfort in that aspect of it. If you look at Saudi Arabia and some other countries, they'd like to see crude oil above $60 a barrel. I just don't see the fundamental drivers to that. And we do have a lot of supply. That's the issue. So seeing those puts being bid, I think that kind of makes sense because people, especially people my path crosses in the industry, they're very cautious at these levels. My feeling is we should go sideways here. We should build value. You know, if you look at a market, one of the rhythms that you and I can look at is how it moves. And typically we we have a big move. It's imbalanced, in this case, imbalanced to the buy side. And now we've been staying between $54 and $52, that $2 range for a few weeks. And I think that's going to continue. Uh, The other thing that's interesting about it, if we think about how it relates to the equity world, when you and I see energy prices now, like crude oil prices moving up a bit, we look at companies, stocks that are involved in the uh, oil exploration production. So if you look at Exxon and Mobil and all these companies out there, uh, we expect them to do well because that could have an impact on their earnings. 
the other side of the coin is that what price level for crude oil does the cost of energy start hurting the profitability of other companies that consume that crude oil, consume that energy? So there's always a fine line between what is the, the most uh, productive price for crude oil for our stock market place in total when we think about a variety of different companies. So it's an interesting market to me, and I think it's doing what it should do right now, and that's not much. Uh, I don't see any justification for strong higher prices or actually for weaker prices. We're in that balance phase. So, But I see, again, Mark, you give us that insight. When we think about those puts, what does it say about the attitude? What is the outlook? Is it hedgers? getting ready to lock in prices, or do they really feel, unless things turn around with demand, that we could definitely be going lower? So it does give us some insights, I think, in terms of market's attitude towards this market right now. Well, it has been the ongoing story of WTI for the better part of a year, if not longer. You know, the skew fading it, fading it, fading it. Could it make it past 40? Could it sustain it, fading it, rallying a little bit, dropping back off? And then recently, you finally saw that warm turn as it blew through the 50 handle. Now, again, right, it seems like it maybe it is perhaps leaning a little bit to the downside. Again, we'll have to dig in a little bit more across all the months to see for sure. But it does seem like those, those 50 puts are where the action is right now. Speaking of action, Dan, you are our guest, so I will allow you to continue your, your steering of the ship, your gentle nudging in direction, sir. So where should we hang our hat next, sir? I have to tell you something that I find an interesting barometer. Uh, and it's performing not the way I thought it would today. And that's the Russell. And Sean, you probably have some insights on that one, too. I, I, the Russell I find fascinating because it's different You know, if you look at the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow, those are all large cap stocks. And we know they they sometimes have a tendency to move in concert. The NASDAQ has a tendency to lead these other indices. And here's the thing. So does the Russell. And that's why the Russell is kind of surprising me right now. You have these small to mid cap companies. So they're not the same as these other indices. They're more agile. And if there's a positive outlook, I look for the Russell to kind of lead the way. And what we've seen over the last few days is we've been kind of in a sideways market. Um, I expected more movement to the upside. So I think you have to be very cautious if you're looking to short the Russell. Uh, my my feeling is the upside is where the potential is in that market. And uh, again, it's kind of lagging behind. It's the weakest out of you know the NASDAQ, Dow, and S&P 500. The, the NASDAQ is kind of leading the way today, uh, making new highs. So it looks pretty healthy. But I, I find the Russell really a, a, an interest, interesting one from a trading point of view, but also a market outlook point of view. Sean, how do you feel about that? Um, really interesting. And, and your perspective is on the trade uh, uh, and today in particular. But if you look at the Russell 2000s index's performance year to date, it is outperforming all of the indices, right? You've got, you've got Russell 2000 small caps up 9.4% year to date. Um, large caps are up, what, 2.93%. Um, you've got the micro cap, which is, are the smallest of the small cap stocks, up 13%, um, which are those smaller stocks within the index that you were talking about, Dan. So yeah, these, these smaller stocks, uh, the, the small cap index, Russell 2000, domestic in nature, really performing well because of its various sectors that aren't the tech highest in tech weight, but in higher in, in healthcare. As you know, it's got, it's got the COVID uh, vaccine bump. It's also got economic stimulus coming for small businesses. Um, these are all steroids for the Russell 2000 right now. And I absolutely see this as um, the reason why, and we've been talking on this on the last few shows of there's a large volume of up 
side call buying that's been happening in the Russell 2000 options on SIBO and CME's options. So it's uh, it's exactly on target with your with your comments. Um, really, really interesting uh, to see this. Um, but uh, as you as you as you mentioned, vol- volatility does come in in rallies. But with this up upside call buying, it has it has kept Russell's two thousand volatility at a at a at a higher level. Even though it's come in, um, it hasn't come in as much as large cap. So you've got that spread widening between the two. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more on the show. But um, really interesting, and I couldn't agree with you more, Dan. Yeah, it it, it is a unique piece of the puzzle. And those calls, again, does say something about the perception that people have going forward, right? Because it gives us an idea of how are people looking out, not not just today. And, you know, these stock indices are forward thinking. And those calls, in this case, I think are an example of that forward thinking. You know, what are people not looking at the next two minutes what are they thinking about for the next few days, few weeks, few months? And that positive attitude eventually gets soaked in uh, to the market. So I, I really do find it an interesting barometer of the stock market. Everyone and their mother these days fixated on small caps. So let's see what's going on. Let's kick it off from a vol perspective in equity land because it's kind of hard to talk equities Without talking volatility, and most of them actually are most of them are down, but not all because we have RVX still holding firm. RVX, of course, that VIX of the small caps actually up a little bit, up about two thirds of a point from where it was this time last week. You've listened into the show for a while, you know it's kind of been glued around that thirty handle, and it's a little bit north of that right now, about thirty and a half coming into the start of the show. So RVX, aka. The VIX of small caps remains stubbornly bid. It's kind of hard to argue. It is moving out there these days. It wasn't in our top five or our bottom five this week, but it was still moving a fair amount out there. Let's see what else is going on from a vol perspective. Coming into showtime, VIX cash, almost 21 and a half. Puts it down about three quarters of a point from last show. Kind of putting the lie to what everyone thought was going on out there. Everyone's been kind of wringing their hands saying, why are we... So elevated in volatility, why is VIX so elevated? Why do we remain stubbornly north of 20? And the conventional wisdom, which again, throw that out the window if you haven't already for the year that was 2020 and now 2021. Conventional wisdom, it's gone. <laughs> conventional wisdom said, oh, it's the inauguration concerns over that, everything with the cat, everything else. That's what's keeping it elevated. You know, that's in the rearview mirror. Volatility actually up a little bit out there. VIX, which is the vol of vol, 113.5, puts it down about six points from where it was this time last week. And Vol Q, a.k.a. the At The Money Vol of the NASDAQ 100, a.k.a. the newest addition to the Vol trading landscape over there at CME. It's about 23 and three quarters coming into showtime. Puts it down almost one and a half points from this time last week. Puts that VIX to RVX spread, a.k.a. the large cap to small cap spread. Around nine points. That's, that's ticking up there. That's about 1.3 points wider than it was last show. So that's getting pretty wide. If you know, historically, it's around a three and a half or so. I, so it, that's, a, that's a lot wider <laughs> than normal. Again, kind of showing small caps, they, they refuse to budge. They're staying at that 30 or so in RVX, whereas VIX is kind of vacillating a little bit. Hence that spread widening it out a little bit. VIX to vol Q, which is VIX versus the at the money vol of NASDAQ. So not quite apples to apples. Maybe gold and delicious to Macintosh, something along those lines. Uh, But that's about two and a third points. That's about a little bit tighter, actually, than it was this time last show, about three quarters of a point tighter. And uh, Dan and Sean, you guys were just talking about what's lighting it up out there in Russell 2000. We can do that ourselves, go to the equity drop down. Pretty active week, almost 20,000 contracts on the tape already. So people are lighting it up out here in the Russell 2000 over there at CME. And what is the lion's share of that? Pretty much 10% over 2,000 Contracts alone are, once again, Sean, you just said it, far upside. By the way, if you're wondering, we're at about a 2120 coming into showtime. So we still need to plan our Russell 2000, north of 2000 party. But that's a conversation for another day. 22 and three quarter calls, 2275 calls were where the action was this week out there in March, listeners, to the tune of about 2000 going up 
this week. So pretty active. All of that pretty much going up yesterday. A big clip <laughs> going up yesterday and all of that opening. So again, we had Dan, or excuse me, we had Matt on the show not too long ago talking about far out of the money calls. He was talking about five Delta calls. These aren't quite five Delta, but they're pretty low. <laughs> Saying these things are fascinating. Well, someone taken up 2,000 of these bad boys this week. So no longer is it the narrative, Sean, that it's all out of the money puts. That said, there were some some out of the money puts, a little bit closer to the out of the money this time. 1980 puts doing about 1,000 contracts this week. Those are going out in week four of Jan. So they're going out in about a week from now. So there was a little bit of downside put action. But lion's share of the action, Sean, yet again. Far upside, out of the money calls, a repeat of recent weeks, Sean. You think this is yet another signal that perhaps, you know, the worm has turned out here in small capster? It, you know, you know, option options trading is is an indication. It's uh, I never ever tell anybody uh, what to trade or how to trade, but uh, um, you know, there's there's two sides to every trade: harvesting that vol. Uh, and also hedging to the upside. So there's um, different directions and different uh, strategies. But uh, we're really in, enjoying the the movement, the volatility, the volume, the the strength in the open interest that we see at our partner exchanges. Letting you know that you can you can take risk, you can hedge risk, you can take risk off um, with confidence and liquidity in the markets at our partner exchanges, CME Group and SIBO. So. Um, I'm I'm just excited that people are having a good experience, um, and that uh, um, investors are benefiting from the the products that we create with our index products. So it's really exciting to see. There's a lot of other exciting things to see over here, Trade Net CME this week. So Dan, so far we've hung our hats on WTI. We've talked a little bit of crypto and a wee bit of equities. What else is floating your boat out there this week, sir? Well, should we take a look at some of the currencies? I think we could do that. We don't get a chance to talk a lot of FX here on the show, listeners. If you want to do that for yourselves, you know where to go. Go to the drop down. Go to foreign exchange FX majors. Let's pick the big dog here. Let's go Euro USD. And then, if you're wondering how much how much paper Euro USD actually does, and it's an interesting time out there watching. All these macro currents unfold. About 54,000 contracts, so it's pretty decent from an overall options perspective. Mr. Dan, what is lighting up your tape out there in the world of all things EURUSD this week, sir? Well, I, I think the euro, when we think about the euro, and for those of you who don't trade currencies, what you're looking at whenever you look at a currency is you're looking at two currencies. You're looking at a spread. So the euro we're looking at is a euro U.S. dollar. If somebody doesn't say what the second item is, it means it's going to be the U.S. dollar. When you look at a chart of it, the numbers you see on the right side represent the value in dollars of the first variable, euro. So it's the cost of buying one euro. That's the way you could think about it. And what we've seen here in the euro over the last few days, it's been headed up to the right which means that the euro is getting more expensive. The dollar value of the euro is increasing. So we would say the euro is strengthening and the U.S. dollar is getting weaker because it costs more U.S. dollars to buy it. So just a few days ago, it was a dollar twenty-one, And now we're approaching almost a dollar twenty-one and three quarters. So it, it's gotten more expensive. The issue is... Is it sustainable? The U.S. dollar overall is it's kind of bearish. We have not been able to sustain a rally in the U.S. dollar. The expectation is that it's going to bleed over to the currencies. Then. These currencies should get stronger. So the euro, the Swissy, Japanese yen, Aussie dollar, British pound, Canadian dollar, which make up the dollar index that we can look at as well are all stronger today. The thing you want to watch, can they maintain this? So right now we're seeing buyers coming in on the euro. We do look for follow through to the upside, but it's at critical levels. We want to get above a dollar twenty two by the end of this week, by the close of tomorrow, by the close of Friday. Because it going into the weekend with confidence. If we kiss one twenty two and back off tomorrow on Friday, 
that would be a sign that people aren't comfortable going home over the weekend with this market. And you'd look for a sideways move next week. So the next few days, I think, in these currencies are going to be revealing about some of the attitude we can look at longer term. So from my point of view, the euro, I'm bullish on it. Uh, I'm cautious at the current levels. And I do look for follow through, especially to the upside in the next two to five days. Let's see what the markets and the traders are following through here. And the options over here at CME, Euro USD listeners, coming at showtime, as Dan was saying, it's at about a 1.2, almost 1.21 out there, off a little over 1%, about 1.14% net here on the week. The most active contract with about, by the way, if you wonder how much I told you, about 54, almost 55,000 contracts, 30, almost 31% of that coming in the Feb contract that expires on the 5th, about 30, like I said, almost 31% of the paper going up out there. If you're wondering vol-wise, a little bit less vol in the FX as opposed to, let's say, your equities or certainly your, your Bitcoin. Everything's less vol than Bitcoin, it seems like, out here. In this contract, we have about a 6.5 vol, so off about a quarter of a point. So not a ton of vol, lighten up the tape. Out here, let's see what we're looking at from an overall skew perspective. Not a lot of movement skew-wise either. The puts last week, 1.4% rich. This week, 1.2% rich. So slight premium to the puts out there. The calls were about half a percent cheap last week. This week, they're 1.5% rich. So a little bit of a swing, a little bit of bid here to the calls. Effectively, you got almost a smile going on. 1.2% bid to the puts, 1.5% bid to the calls. Not a lot of really market bias in either direction here in the skew. In terms of where the action was out here, we're looking at right around this 1.2 level out here, listeners. That seems to be where the lion's share of the paper was aggregating out here. It looks like the biggest print, though, was actually in the 1.23 calls out here in March. So expiring on the 5th of March, you got about 48 days to go. They did, oh, about 3,000 contracts. Looks like the most active day was Monday, about half of that, 1,500 going up on Monday. Most of that opening, so a little bit of opening upside here in March. Beyond that, most of the other months are 1.2 puts, listeners. That seems to be where the lion's share of the action was aggregated out here this week. Mr. Dan, any any surprises, many of that? And then we got a little time left before we got to get to the listeners. So what other product is on the tip of your tongue this week, sir? Well, first, I would say there's no surprise. I don't feel like there was any surprise on what you revealed other than the 23 uh, put, I mean, calls uh, being bid. Again, it said something about people's attitude. If we get near that level, the real critical level is we need to get above not 123, but 123 and a half, 123.50. That's where we need to explode above that if indeed buyers are here. From my point of view, I really look for the euro to stay in the sideways market, that 121 to 123, about a two cent range. And I think most of these currencies are going to be in that two cent range. You know, we're still trying to sort out Brexit. Even though it's been done, it's not really done. The economic impact hasn't really been felt. Uh, the British, for our friends in the UK, they're going to have to get 6,000 laws off their books. They got to renegotiate 1,100 treaties. So there's still some fallout uh, that we can expect to see over the new next few months anyways with regard to that. Shall we take a, a journey over to um, – do you want to do metals? Shall we do gold? I think we can make that happen, sir. Again, listeners, head on over to the metals land. Hit the precious tab. You can look at others if you like, base or ferrous. We're going to hang our hat in precious this week. Click on gold, and then you're off to the races, listeners. Interesting time out here for the metals. You know, Dan was just talking about the macro currents, how they're impacting the dollar, but also interesting to watch how they're buffeting gold of late these days. Coming into showtime, gold at about 1829, so off about a third of a percent on the week. Obviously, also well off those north of 2000 highs. It hit not that far back out there. If you're curious how gold performed over the course of the year and how it stacks up against some of the assets, I encourage you to check out our. 
year in review show we just did not too long ago here where we broke down the, the cross-asset correlation of some of these different asset classes, including gold and how it relates to things like the equities, things like Bitcoin, which people often say is the digital gold. Kind of surprising stuff. I encourage you to check it out if you missed it. Listeners, like we said, coming at the showtime right around the 1830 strike out there. Gold, by way of comparison, pretty active. 208,000 contracts on the tape out there. So it's doing some paper. And of that, 40% of that coming in the Feb contract out here. So let's go see what's afoot here in February. By the way, not a lot of, not a lot of vol left on the tape out here. Of course, this contract only has 11 days to go. But since it dominated the tape, we'll make an exception for looking at things beneath two weeks here. The vol was 1488 off five points. <laughs> That's a big, it's a big squeeze. You know, if you pay attention to the gold ball for a while, it, it, the spikes are kind of short lived, and it's kind of hard sometimes for premium buyers to to make it happen out here. And coming in pretty aggressively yet again this week. Skew wise, last week the puts were three point five percent rich. This week, about four and a half percent rich. So getting bit up about a point. Uh, last week the calls three point six percent rich. So last week we actually had a. An exact smile out here in this contract. 3.5% bid to the puts, 3.6% bid to the calls. This week, the calls have come in. They're only 1.1% rich. So calls come in, puts getting a little bit more bid. So instead of that nice equidistant smile like we had last week, it's kind of a a crooked smirk to the puts now with the calls almost unched unched to the at the money in terms of vol premium. Let's see what the most active contract, the hot trade was out here in gold. Looks like I said we're at about an 1829. Looks like the 1920 calls are where the lion's share of the action was out here in February, doing a little over 10,000, about 10,500. That shows kind of a broad smattering of the paper here. 10,500 is enough for the number one spot out here this week. Everything else was kind of scattered in, in smaller trades. The, most of that action, though, was on Thursday, 8,200 going up on Tuesday, the rest scattered throughout the week, and a good chunk of that opening. So opening paper on the 1920 call strike, almost 100 handles out of the money. That's interesting. Let's see what else was lighting up. You know, if we're talking gold, we have to go a little bit farther out. Look for, shall we say, the aberrant paper, the esoteric, the the weird paper. It's always going up in gold. Usually it's to the upside, and that was the case again. Looks like this week we got 22 halves were pretty active out here in October to the tune of almost 4,000. So not a small trade uh, going up, uh, let's see, 3,750 on Monday. <laughs> so now all in one print. No, nothing else with it. No verticals, no ratios like we usually see. Just almost 4,000 of the 22 half calls going up out here this week. Again, those were in October. So again, it, it isn't that far off the high as we hit last year, but it does seem like it's it's a pretty impressive number. We also saw, I feel like, a little bit of downside out here. There was some downside, in particular, the 17 half puts going up nearly 5,000 times here in August as well. Looks like about 3,000 on Tuesday and about 1,800 on Wednesday. All of that opening. So a lot of opening downside paper here as well. So it's not all biased to the upside like it usually is in gold this week. Both sides getting the action here, upside and downside, bi-directional action here, listeners, in all things gold. Dan, anything else lighting up your tape out here in terms of gold this week, sir? Well, I would say on gold, what you just described exactly matches the price action we're seeing. If Again, when I think about gold, I think of it as what I call an excuse market. It's a market that is driven by supply and demand. Not typically 80% of it's used in jewelry. We do have some industrial applications. We do see central bank, especially developing countries, central bank accumulating gold. So there is some demand in that regard. But the rest of it is perception. You know, what determines that we should trade 1868? Is it because we don't have enough? No, that's not really the driver there. It's more of that barometer of uncertainty. Well, do we have high inflation? No, we really don't have that. Uh, Do we have any major uncertainties out there right now? Uh, No, not at this moment, but there could be a geopolitical thing that's brewing that we're not aware of. And 
we would expect money to flow towards gold uh, when that happens because people look for that reserve of value. Uh, but gold, the challenge for gold, I think, for the last year has really been its ability to follow through. You know, we hit 1950 a little while ago, and we find sellers at 1950. At 1950, people are saying, I can taste 2000. It's going to be there. Well, we see it back off from it. We hit 1800, buyers came right back in. The issue is we're not seeing that strong follow through. Strong follow through from my point of view would be by Wednesday of next week, we're trading above 1900, closing above 1900. That would tell us that there is some momentum behind this market. The next challenge will be, can we close and move above 1950? Or do we kiss it again and back off? Again, people are constantly anticipating the magic number of 2000. So we have that psychological number out there. So when you mentioned those calls, that's that long-term outlook. And that, I think, makes sense for the attitude that people have toward gold. So it's a very interesting market. Uh, it's a perception market. And it's also one that we haven't seen consistent follow-through. And I think the next couple of weeks may give us some insights into that longer-term behavior for the gold market. You know, it is consistent, though. It's our listeners. So without further ado, let's get to them with some of their futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options you can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Some of your feedback. Kick things off with a comment from Zeely KW. I mentioned this on the option block. I want to touch on it here as well. It's a good, good way to kick off the year with a little bit of some good vibes. He says, total noob here. Huge fan, guys. Appreciate all your content. Very new to this, and with your help, I'm starting to grasp things better. Still have a million and one questions, but I enjoy listening to the content. I'll listen as much as I can before wasting time. With questions. I had to let you guys know. I appreciate it. And you guys are amazing. Left a five-star review on the Play Store. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Zeely KW, and everybody else out there who's taken the time to read and rate and review our stuff over there on whatever, the App Store, Google Play Store, like he did, Zeely here. You could do it in the iTunes Store for podcasts, Google Pod, wherever you get our content. Rating and reviewing, it helps keep new folks discovering the shows out there. It really is the lifeblood of everything. That we do over here. So thank you, Zeely. Thank you, everybody else. You guys are amazing. Not us. Turn, turn it on you. You guys are the amazing ones. All right. Next up, Neil. Neil wants to know. This sounds like a good one for Dan because Dan trades, I think, 700 products on a daily basis. <laughs> he wants to know, what is a realistic number of products that I should have a handle on trading? Should I abandon trying to trade equities and metals and ags and energy and instead focus on one only. A great show. Well, I'm, I'm going to read between the lines on your question here, Neil. Maybe it sounds like from your question, maybe, maybe it sounds like maybe you're having a problem keeping track of all of that. So it wouldn't be the worst thing maybe to maybe retreat a little bit and, and focus on a few areas. Doesn't, I mean, there's a lot going on. We talked about each of these products for you know, 10, 15 minutes each today. We could have done a lot more. There's a lot to watch. The skew, the volatility, the options activity, what's going on with the future. I mean, all these things to watch across a variety of months and expirations. Justin, you know, pick your poison and in the equities and in the ags, whatever the heck you're watching. There's a lot to watch just in that one product. So maybe, maybe it wouldn't hurt to, to focus a little bit, get what's going on down in one product, get a feel for it. And then maybe you expand. But I'll, I'll let Dan dive in on this one because he's, he's the guy who's slinging 8 million products a day. Dan, do you, do you have a, a rule of thumb for, as Neil 
puts it a realistic number of products that he should have a handle on trading, sir? Well, you know, I think Neil's question is terrific, and it's one that all of us need to think through. Um, a couple of <clears throat> thoughts at first is, one, what are you doing, Neil? Are you day trading all those markets? Are you swing trading them, which is something that lasts from one day to maybe six months? Or are these trades that you want to put on and you're looking for it to last you know, longer than that, a position trade? So I think that has an impact on how much information you and I can monitor uh, depending on our time frame. The other aspect, and Mark, I think you hit it right on the head, and it's something that happened to me when I first started. Um, it, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. And when you feel overwhelmed, it becomes very stressful. And so your decision process actually kind of goes down a bit when we're in that kind of environment. The other thing that I – or what I did, actually, uh, because I started looking at stock options. That's where my journey in the market began. And then I went over to these guys that looked at price, those guys at the Board of Trade. And I went there on a rice seat, actually. But – Here's what I did. I picked one market. And at the time, it was the bond, U.S. Treasuries, the 30 years. That was the hot product. But I took it apart. I, I had a feel for when it would open on an unemployment day. If the first 15 minutes moved four ticks, that meant what for the rest of the day? Uh, at noon, what was the typical behavior? Uh, at different reports, how did it typically react? So I had a feel for the rhythm of that market. And those were just tools I was looking at. You may look at something different, but what it gave me is it gave me a reference. So when I wanted to add a currency, uh, it, it I would look at that currency, like let's say uh, – Japanese yen, and I'd say, oh my gosh, Japanese yen, it does something different than what the bonds did. But I had the bonds. I had the bond market reference to tell me what was typical and not typical with Japanese yen. So it was easy for me, or not necessarily easy, but it was a way for me to add Japanese yen and to add other currency, to add crude oil. I knew it when it was similar. I knew it was different. One other thing that you might want to think about is that if we're looking at futures at the CME group, they trade almost 24 hours a day. So I think it's important for you and I to have a feel for not only what happens in the U.S. session, what's typical range, what's typical behavior in the Asia session, which starts at 5 o'clock, and what's typical in the European session, which starts around 1 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the morning, depending on the time of year, Chicago time I'm talking about. That can give us some clues. So my thought is pick a market you're most interested in that you want to follow and start with that. And hopefully that'll give you a guideline to look at other markets. Uh, Sean, you may have some ideas on this too. I do. Um, and I'm really glad you, you, you uh, asked me, Dan. Um, and, and a great question from Neil. Um, I'm a former derivatives trader for, for many years. And I've been, a, I was a, a derivatives trader, options trader on, Various equity floors, Philex in Philly, the Amex in New York. I started in, on the Philex, uh, traded on the options floor of the New York Stock Exchange, traded options on the CME and S&P options. Um, but the trading firm I came from trained me to trade all asset classes. So your question, you're, you seem to be diving into each of these asset classes. But when I became that trader, once I graduated from being a trade assistant, I focused on a specific asset class. So it sounds to it, the, the the company wanted us to be able to contribute to the firm in a, in a, in a very organized fashion. I couldn't go from an equity pit to a, to the grain pit uh, and, and, and really focus and put a hundred percent of my efforts if I was diversifying a portfolio for the trading firm I was uh, coming that I worked for, so uh, you know I come from a, uh, some advice in regards to the way some of our largest proprietary trading firms have their traders focused, and it's on a specific product. 
and they want you to really dive into that product, know what makes it move, know what makes it not move so much, and be able to capitalize on that. So my advice to you would be to, yeah, not trade, not try to trade a bunch of products, but really focus your energies and your efforts and really capitalize on a learning experience in a specific asset class. That, that would be my advice to you, Neil. Great advice, everybody. It never hurts to, to start small. You can always build on that, Neil. Maybe in your case, uh, draw back a little bit and, and focus a little bit and get your sea legs back under you. And you can always build on that. From There's always more products to trade. You don't have to trade them all right away. <laughs> get your feel for them first and keep rolling. Great questions, everybody. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of another epic sojourn through the world of all things futures options. But before we go, Mr. Dan, if folks have questions like Neil about any of the oh, 8 million products that you analyze over there at dangramsa.com, uh, where should they go? What should they do? And also, do you have any maybe uh, teases you want to leave with our audience about what you're going to be looking at next? Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Well, I, I have a website, dangramsa.com, as you mentioned, and there's a free daily video uh, it lasts two to three minutes. So if you've never looked at futures, I look at futures. They're daily charts. These are swing trades. So you'll see red and green lines representing buy and sell levels for me. Not suggesting it for anyone else, but it's just to give you an idea of how I would approach those markets. I do look at 22 different markets, and we'll highlight some of those markets every day. In fact, I'll be doing that after we finish our, our time together today for tomorrow. I do it every trading day. And the intent, if you only trade stock indexes, maybe it's a way to look at other markets. So if you've never traded futures, it's just a way to get a feel for them. It gives you an idea of how they unfold. And you can start there just by watching them. And that free daily video may be a way to add some ideas to your thought process as well. There you go, dangramza.com. Check it out if you haven't done so already. And, Sean, where should folks go if they want to hit you up about all the madness that is afoot in small caps these days, sir? Mark, again, thanks for having me on the show. Dan, truly a pleasure and an honor to be on the show with you. It's always fantastic to uh, to talk derivatives and markets with you. I learn something every time I'm on the show with you. So thank you for that. And, and again, just great to be with you today. Um, Thank you, and back to uh, where to find me, Sean.Smith at LSEG.com. Um, FTSERussell.com is a fabulous website and just a tremendous depth of, no- depth of information in regards to our index products and derivatives products where you can uh, trade products that are obviously listed at our partner exchanges, CME Group and CBO. Um, something else I wanted to mention and you know, Mark, maybe next week we can talk about this, but the FIA came out with their annual volume numbers today and open interest. Oh, yes. Globally. That's always a fun report. I haven't had a, I've been doing shows. Report. I haven't had a chance to crunch the numbers yet myself. Just got the report. It's fresh off the press, but uh, we can kind of break that down next week. It'll be kind of fun. But numbers are just huge uh, globally. Um, so just wanted to whet everybody's appetite for that. But uh, um, thank you again for uh, 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 having me on the show again this week. And Sean.Smith at LSEG.com if you need anything or any questions about our markets. Happy to help you. There you go. You know where to find them as well. All that research, all the webinars, all the good stuff they have, FTSERussell.com. Give them a follow on the old Twitter while you're at it, at FTSERussell. And, of course, you know where to go for all the reports we're talking about here today, links to the show, research, all that other cool stuff, CMEGroup.com place to go for all that data and a lot more. Speaking of the data, I'm seeing what you're talking about here now, Sean. I just the FIA port just came through my inbox. Fascinating stuff. Well, all the global trends in derivatives trading. We'll get to all that soon on the show. We'll be back again tomorrow, listeners, live noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Talk a little bit of volatility. Try to parse the mysteries of what's going on with VIX and everything else on volatility views. Then we kick it all off again on Monday with the option block and the crypto rundown all the way through to Thursday and another episode of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. 
CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 